Okay, let's talk about tongue twisters first. So hopefully you will have collected them by now and you're in the throes of interpretation, figuring out co-articulation versus accessing errors. Who's got one? If you have it all figured out, we don't need to talk. Yeah. Uh, I did this as a zither. Oh, that's one of the trickiest ones I know. Well, I have a hard time doing it. I just gauge it solely on myself, of course. This I found is my boyfriend wasn't saying is. And the, well, and now, the your, your boyfriend's the one who is, has a hearing impairment, right? Fine. That's yours. Okay, sorry. No. <laughs> just wanted to be sure we weren't confounding with deaf speech here. <laughs> okay, so you've got this is a z See, I've even had a hard I time saying plain. I found the was S, or it didn't come out as a zither. It was a zither. It was a sort of a... This is a zither? Exactly. <laughs> Must be the most natural way to screw it up. This is a zizzer. Okay, so what substitutions are happening? So first be objective about it. Figure out what's being substituted for what. I think that since the S is voiceless, he wasn't being able to get the I is, because it was all coming. This no, don't, don't mix up the vowels. Go phoneme by phoneme. He didn't screw up the I in is, right? No. Okay. He said it as sort of one word, this is. This is a zither. Because he was like, this is a zither, this is a zither. And, I, and I, the is is when, I, after the third or fourth try, I stopped hearing it. Like the repetition. Okay, what's one of the most obvious substitutions that the person's making? He's doing this is a zither. Z for S. Okay, so Z for S. So, and then, uh, which is what kind of error? A voicing error. And then is he doing zither or zither? Zither. So voicing er errors are predominating so far. Zither. It's like the Z took over everything, right? Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> well, no, it's not bad. It gives you stuff to talk about. You don't want perfection on these. Um, so why do you think? Why do you think um, there was a Z for th substitution? This is a zither, but he produced no ths. Yeah. Because all those surrounding sounds aren't, like there's no voiceless surrounding it, so it's easier to just stay voiced. Okay, it's definitely easier to stay voiced. So he's, but that, that's not the only thing about the th for s substitution. So voicing is more efficient. You don't have to do the laryngeal abductory maneuver. So you stay voiced, you increase efficiency, keeps your speaking rate up. Go ahead. Um, timing of actually moving the articulator back and forth, like up front and then back to for saying the Z or the S? For the TH. So it's just easier to keep it in the most predominant sound, which are the, the S's and Z's. The S's. Yeah. So that one, does that seem more like an accessing problem or more like uh, just trying to be efficient? Yeah, I'm going for efficiency on that one. It's not like there's anticipatory, you know, um, it's just sort of getting everything down to the most basic common denominator. Everything is voiced and everything is going to be a Z. So I don't think necessarily you could call it anticipatory. You could consider it being perseverative articulation because of the uh, continuous voicing. So he's, he's just sustaining that voicing, he's perseverating on voicing. Um, and not going back and forth between them. So if I were arguing for anything co-articulatory, it would be perseverative, where the ease of whatever's going on is just being maintained. Does that make sense? Any other thoughts on that one? That was relatively straightforward. But be sure you do phoneme by phoneme transcription. So you don't ever want to imply that something was an error that was actually produced correctly. Most of these, I think, will elicit consonant errors rather than vowel errors. Who else has one? Yeah. Three tree twigs. He was saying three. Wait a sec. So it's three tree twigs. Right. Three tree twigs. Three. He was saying. <laughs> Everybody three. has to try it, of course. <laughs> you, you can't figure it out otherwise. Three tree twigs, three tree twigs, three tree twigs, three tree twigs. Okay. Three tree twigs, three tree twigs. Okay, so what's, what, in your gut reaction, what's the predominant error going to be? Twee. Twee. 
twee, W for our substitution. Twee, twee, twigs. <laughs> Sounds like Tweety Bird, right? Twee, twee, twigs. <laughs> yeah. Then Is that was, what your person did? Right, he did. Oh, good. But he, okay. said, he said three, twee, trigs. So he switched the R and the W from the tree and the twigs. How quickly was he saying it? Pretty quickly. No, like, give, do, do like, how fast he was doing it. Three, two, twigs, three, two, twigs, three, two, twigs, three, two, twigs. Okay, so that's pretty quick. Did he take a breath in between? I don't remember. I have to listen to it again. Remember, you got to watch to see if the person's making it five truly, truly in a row or if they're, if they're sneaking in some pauses. What happens when you sneak in a pause for something like this? What does the articulatory system do? Completely regroups. Right. It starts over. So you're not going to get any pervasive effects from a first utterance to the last if the person is taking a breath to break it up. So three tree twigs. So he's doing, there's a name for that. Well, it's a spoonerism, but there's another name for it. Is that an alliterative error? When you flip it, I think it's a spoonerism. But it's a programming error. So if you're just doing three twee trigs, three twee trigs. Did you do that throughout? Mm, pretty much. Like three twee trigs, three twee trigs, three twee trigs, three twee trigs. I made him do it more than five times. <laughs> Cruel taskmaster, more than five times. Okay, what's the best explanation for that one? Three twee trigs. We're trying to correct what you just did. Like well, he had three right. I know. Oh, I see what he, you're saying. So three twee. Rick fi figured out that he said trigs. three wrong, so he was thinking about the R for trigs. Maybe. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. So trying to self-correct, but being too late. Okay, so self-correction error is a possibility. Three twee trigs. Three twee trigs. And I think once you start it, if you're, if you're doing it all in a row, it's hard to shift out of the error that you made. It, it would be hard to stop. You'd almost have to stop and regroup to fix the tree twigs. Um, so it could be that it was anticipatory. So he was anticipating the twigs when he said the twee. And it could be that it was a self-correction error, that he was trying to self-correct but couldn't. Yeah, that's as good as any. That's a weird one. Yeah. Um, I know that when I was doing it, because when I was looking at them doing it myself, if I looked at it while I was saying it, sometimes I like anticipated the next word. Uh -huh. So I'd mess it up because I was looking at the next word, but saying, you know, if it was three words, I was saying the second word, but looking at the third, so it was kind of... Scanning ahead. Up. And the mm -hmm. scanning ahead would screw you up? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point, too. So ideally, I mean, I think the best way to do these is not looking at them. Um, because then you know that you're really getting pure programming rather than potential reading errors. Because you're right, everyone's going to scan ahead and that would screw you up. So which one did you do? Well, the one I picked to do for my person was toy boat, but when I was looking at things, the S's would mess me up. It was, um, I think it was six thick swamps. Tell me again which it was. Six thick swamps. Anything that has an Six S thick really swamps. Six yeah. thick swamps. Six thick swamps. Six thick. Yeah, that's ugly. You start <laughs> screwing up on those. Second S in six. Okay, so if you haven't done it yet, don't let your person read it. Okay, because um, I think you, you, you want to minimize as many confounding variables as possible. And the way everybody reads, particularly if you're reading aloud, you're scanning ahead to maintain fluency. So that would really influence it. Okay, who else has one? Yeah. My girl wanted to, my friend who did it, wanted to correct herself all the time. So I had to tell her, like, don't. <laughs> Try not to. Shut up. She would say it wrong and then recorrect. So I don't know if that was right, but I was like, don't do it. But I found, that's why I kind of got the self-correcting, is because she we did good blood, bad blood. And she did, well, she did, the first two were pretty good, but the second one, she didn't breathe, but she kind of, blood, you know, uh -huh. to try to get it right. Uh -huh. And then um, she did good blub bad blood correctly but then the third fourth one was good blood bad blub so it's almost like she didn't so she was doing final consonant errors yeah in the so beginning usually in that one people mess up the b and the bl 
Well, the last thing you, she you did. You end with Vlad Blood. She did Bub at the end. For the Bub last at the one. end. She was real perfectionist. I was like, please just flow. <laughs> <laughs> Some people just don't flow. I know. <laughs> Good blood, bad blood, good blood, bad blood, good. You have to try it with me. I'm not doing this solo. Good blood, bad blood. I'm trying to figure out how you get bub. Good blood. It was almost like the Good blub. Oh, oh, so you, what you had was good blub bad. So you had the B coming in soon. Yeah. So that could almost be anticipatory coarticulation, couldn't it? Yeah, and then the second one, she did good blood correctly, bad blub. So I said that Bad blub. Bad from blub. From so that would potentially be perseverative, mm -hmm. bad blood. It's like she was correcting. Yeah. She knew she did that first one wrong, and so she was correcting it, and then she messed up the last You need to note that, that the perfectionist self-correction was in here, because that's really an atypical error on that one. Yeah. You usually end up with blad blood. Blad. Yeah. It's the, it's the blend that intrudes. Blad, yeah. Yeah. She, she omitted the L in the last one. It was bad blood. Okay, so simplification, again, trying to get to something easier and more efficient to produce. Yeah. So we want mellow people who can talk fast to do this. <laughs> I don't they'll know that they exist. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you didn't have the mellow part going for Okay, the one I actually made my person say was... Made my person say, <laughs> damn, you do it now. <laughs> uh, was the toy boat one. Uh -huh. and she would say toy fine, but the last, the third one, she would say boat, and yep. then she said boit. Yeah, that's good. Toy <laughs> boat. Now, the only thing that, that makes me wonder a little, about, about, a little bit about the toy boat is how much lip rounding do you guys do on boat? If you just say boat by itself, do you have much? No. You don't. Okay, because sometimes I could convince myself there's lip rounding on the O for boat. If you really boat. So you think it'd be too exaggerated. So... So any distortion on the boat, I'm inclined to attribute to the oi, the, the heavy lip rounding that you have to have on the oi. Okay. And remember, it seems like lip rounding is, is kind of one of the heavier articulatory moves that tends to influence adjacent sounds pretty easily. Yeah. Uh, is that where the W is coming into, where you say boat? Is it the anticipating the lip rounding? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, so that's what I would think toy boat. And you've got your lips involved with it, so they're already kind of programmed to be doing something, toy boat. Toy boat. Yeah. Well, boat, I thought it was maybe anticipating the T, because you put that boy. No, but listen to the vowels, toy boat. If you're doing toy boat, you're perseverating on the vowel configuration that you had for the toy. Because toy boat, oi, o, oh, you have to pull your tongue back for the O. Oh. Don't you think? Toy boy is easier than toy boat. Toy boy, toy boy. So it almost seems like one of the things that's happening is we know that you're saying things as fast as you can anyway. It's like the system wants to make it go fast. Toy boat. So you, you, anything you think you can get away with, you will. Especially, I think, subtle moves. It, it seems like there's two things going on. Subtle things like oi to o. Oh. The oi is going to kind of pervade, and then the lip rounding goes over everything. It's not like toy beat. I don't think people would screw up toy beat as much as they do toy boit. Toy beat, toy beat, toy beat. Yeah, because it's a much more extreme movement and less influenced by the one in front of it. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, lemon liniment. Uh, lemon liniment? Yes. I love that one. Oh, thanks. And um, she did okay on the word lemon, but liniment had lots of variations. And like she kind of, I think, neutralized the vowels because she'd go from I to E and then she'd leave off the final N. Well, now, was she doing lemon liniment? Is it liniment? Lemon. Right. Mm -hmm. Lemon liniment or lemon liniment? I think she did. Did she do that? Th that's when you could really get the I for the E in lemon. Did yeah. she change the vowel? I think, I mean, I, had, I listened to it so many times but it's hard to get it. Um, I, think, I think it was just the I, lim, maybe it's the E on the end, but in, at the end of the liniment, she definitely, you know, changed the vowel to the more like E eh instead of I, eh, I think. Give us a slow version loud, how, how you okay. think she said it. Uh, lemon liniment. Lemon liniment. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't sound that bad to me. Did she ever mix up the M and the N? 
Um, but well, by the end, she was saying limlament. So <laughs> limlament, good. <laughs> that pervasive L in there. Lemon limlament. Lemon limlament. That's cute. Lemon limlament. 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 Lemon limlament. So it's. All, I'm trying to figure out the syllabification for it. Lemon limlament. Limlament. Liniment. Don't know. That one. The L is just intruding. I, I wrote down that it's perseveratory. But it seems perseverative. Okay. Yeah. And then she replaced um, limb, lament, like, you know, she changed that lin to limb. So That's the most common. The Liniment goes to liminant. Yeah. Because a lot of people don't say it right in the first place. <laughs> so it, it's an easy one to confuse. So though that would be one where I would think that the M and the N are stored fairly close, mm -hmm. literally, and close, uh, close in the brain. So it would be easy to get, and they're all nasals. The only thing that's different is that subtle place of our tick. Lim, liniment, liminant. So just kind of like that might be an access error. Yeah, I, w I would vote for an access error on that one. The vowel ones in that, the, the eh is not a very strong vowel. And so it's, I think with the, the weaker sounds like the eh and the i, eh, it's relatively easy to get some vowel substitutions in there. And a lot of people in Texas do if for eh anyway. Is this a Texan talking? Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, lemon would not be that unusual. It's like that pin for pen. Does that work? Yeah. You've given us a couple explanations for each tongue twister. We need to state all those explanations or as much as we can on the observation. Whatever you think fits. You say these are the possible things that could have been happening. This is what I think really was going on. Because you guys have the advantage of seeing the person do it, which really does make a difference. You know, you can see where they're struggling, you can see if they hesitate, you can see if they self-correct, you can see if they breathe. You know, I can't tell that from your transcription. Although in the transcription, if they took a breath, you need to like put a slash at the end of it to indicate that it wasn't one continuous thing, okay? Because that, that really does make a difference. Who has other ones? Go ahead. Red leather, blue leather, yellow leather. Everybody try it. <laughs> red leather, blue leather, yellow leather. Red leather, blue ye leather. Oh, blue leather. Red leather, blue leather, yellow leather. Red leather, blue leather, yellow. Oh, blue leather. Blue leather, is that what happens? You get blue leather and you get boo leather. It's so, like the, the L drops off. The, so the L is, is killing some of these. Blue leather. And you or get blue leather le sometimes too instead of leather. Because of the D. I, I guess so, yeah. It's Red leather. The D can kind of go into the L. Red leather, blue leather, blue leather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yellow leather. Bled. <laughs> <laughs> leather. Okay. So let's take them one by one. Do they do usually do red leather right? It's, it's, at least the first time it's not. First time it's normally right for sure. Sometimes you'll get some bleeding towards the end. I don't. I don't have it, my transcript with me, but. And then the, a common one was blue leller. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's perseverative for the L. Mm -hmm. Blue leller. I wonder if that's because L's in such a strange position in the mouth. You know that lateral sound. There, there isn't anything else that's like an L. So it almost seems that that's one of the reasons it's imposing itself. Blue leller. And then when you get letter for leather, that just seems um, almost a simplification kind of thing and some perseveration of the it's D. It's almost like the, the tongue can't get between the teeth fast enough because you're trying to do it fast right. and you end up hitting the, the D. So it's efficiency it plus you had the influence of the previous D mm -hmm. in the red. So there's probably a number of things going on. I think efficiency underlies a lot. And then those, those invasive, intrusive sounds seem to be another one. Any others? Yeah. I did the sun shines on stop signs. <laughs> does, it, do, does it say the the? Uh, yes. The sun shines on stop signs. OK, everybody try all his together. The sun shines on stop signs. The sun shines on stop signs. The sun shines on stop signs. Now, that one doesn't seem as hard to me. The sun shines. Oh, so it's like Sally and the seashells. Mm -hmm. The sun shines on stop signs. Yeah, there you go. The sun shines on stop signs. The sun shines on stop signs. The sun shines on stop signs. Okay, so if it's... So again, you can kind of argue either way. 
Sunshines, sunshines. How many times did it take her to do sunshines? Um, on the second one, she started doing sunshines. So the sunshines on stop signs, the sunshines. So you would vote for anticipatory, yeah. And also with that one, I'm inclined to think that the SH requires less precision of placement than the S does. It's easier to, to slush into a palatal than it is to get the precision for the S. Do I need to do a different one? That no, I think that would be fine. Because that was really the only How fast did she do it? No, for some reason, I, I guess one of the things I try to figure out is why that one doesn't seem all that hard. The sun shines on stop signs, sun shines on stop signs, sun shines on stop signs. It only has one SH. No, sun shines on stop signs. Yeah, it only has one SH, which makes it simpler. And it has the the that breaks up all the S's and SH's together. So talk a little bit about why it didn't elicit a lot of, a lot of errors. That would be fine. Because it seems like the, the sounds, as soon as you intersperse unrelated sounds, it gets easier. So the hardest ones are the ones that have like S to X to SH all in a row, like that six sheep, six sheep thing. Um, so I think that one, because it only had one intrusive SH and the rest were S's, was um, actually not, that, not too tough. Yeah. I had a question on, and I don't know if you could answer this, <laughs> but rubber baby buggy bumpers, to me it just doesn't sound like there's a lot of errors in it, and I can't see how that would be a tongue twister. Yeah, I never thought it was a terrible one either. Because the only thing that people are going to screw up is the G and the B. And they're fairly part, far apart from each other. Um, so I agree. There, there are some popular ones. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers is one of the easiest things in the world to say. Again, it's a bilabial and a velar. So when the sounds are distant, it's not that tough. And there's no blends in rubber baby buggy bumpers. Well, I mean, even Betty Better bought a bit of better. Exactly. It, yeah. Because, again, you've got the alternating things. There's not enough to screw up. And that's more like a story one that sounds cool, but it's not. Um, it doesn't have enough close sounds. Uh, to make it hard. Yeah, so if you find one that elicit maybe one or two errors but not a lot, then go ahead and talk about why not. You know, sometimes it could be the person's speaking rate, but you should be eliciting a fast rate and continuous productions. Um, so if it's one that you're sure you did that, then figure out what it is in the tongue twister that made it not, not the greatest. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah. Going back to your explanation on <clears throat> when the sounds are really close together, would that explain the? It's so hard for me. Which ri the, the, the wrist watches are Swiss wrist watches? I can never get it. Which out. wrist watches are Swiss? Swi yeah. <laughs> w. Wi which wrist watches are Swiss Swiss wrist? Which wrist watches are Swiss? That is a hard one. Which wrist watches are Swiss wrist? Swiss wrist watches. Which wrist watches are Swiss wrist? Where are you guys making the error? Wrist watches. Which, because you've got which, and then you have to make it wrist. Which wrist watches are Swiss wrist watches? Which wrist watches are Swiss wrist? The Swiss wrist. And you've got the W right before. Swiss wrist. Yeah. That is a hard one. I think W for R substitutions are really ones that are prone to error because they're real similar sounds. And yeah. Wrist is spelled with a W. But you're not. That shouldn't influence it. it you're not reading it. Oh, come on! You're not reading it. I know, but think, I think in phonetics. It, you're I, going to be a speech pathologist. You have to think in phonetics. I know, but <laughs> I visualize like I don't know. I got you. You have to think in terms of sounds. Wait, I mean... Or press your button. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so finish up those. Um, I think we've got enough options for explaining them, right? So it's a matter of doing a careful transcription, making sure you, you know what the person did as you were watching them do it, because I really think that makes a difference. Um, okay. 
So we were talking about uh, co-articulation, and I want to um, I want to show you a couple of tapes that I've really liked, uh, and I want you to figure out why they are not as natural as they should be, as you think they potentially could be. I'm pretty sure he explains what he's doing in this. Yeah, it should be compared in the middle, no tricks, lots of memorization, trial and error. YouTube one, of course. Um, I don't know if it's called backward speech. We'll I'll find the URL for you. So there, there's <laughs> is that cool effect. Come on. Um, there's there's one more I'm going to play, but I want you to I want you to know what you're listening to before the next one. Why do you think it wasn't perfect? What did you notice that made it not not the perfect song? Yeah, because it was backwards. So the any error would be, or like co-articulation would be reversed, so it wouldn't be natural. Yep. I think the main thing is co-articulation. So you, when you're singing it backwards, you're doing the correct co-articulation for a backward syllable, which is not going to be the correct co-articulation for a forward syllable. Does that make sense? And so the sounds I was noticing at the most on, this is what I want you to listen for in the next one. I was noticing the distortions most on W's, and that would make sense because you'd expect anticipatory co-articulation from the lip rounding. And then if you wouldn't have that, it would screw up the perception of the W. So try to figure out what, a, there were a couple, there was a T that should have been more aspirated that wasn't, and you wouldn't have aspirated it in the backwards, but you should have in the forwards. So he's good, but he's not perfect. So listen for some specific sounds in this one. It's the same concept. Does it backwards first and then reverses it. Make <laughs> 
R's, R's and W's. They're the hardest ones to get right going backwards and forwards. That one I thought was better. It was a shorter song, but it was, it was better than the, the sounds in the other one. So co-articulation adds an element of naturalness, and when you do backward speech and then reverse it, you just don't have that. I thought that was slick. <laughs> Are, are those real songs in other languages? No, he He's no. Just, the, what the guy does is he learns backwards. it backwards. Okay. Wow. He speaks it. He sings it backwards. Right. See, I, th I thought he had found songs that when no. he played them backwards, that they sounded similar. No, it's "Take Me Out to the Ball Game," but he reversed it, and he did it phonetically, not by spelling. Oh. <laughs> A speech pathologist in the wings. <laughs> All right. So much time. So much time. Yes. <laughs> so much. You have to wonder what he does with his life. But I thought they were great. There, he has. He has like at least one other that I've seen that, and some of them just don't work nearly as well. So those were the two best. Um, I love the popping balloons. I think that's the coolest part. Okay, so we're going to finish up um, talking about prosody and um, some perception and production issues. One of the characteristics of prosody um, and one of the things that we've talked about a lot is speaking rate. And this illustrates what happens um, when a person goes from a very, very slow speaking rate to a very, very fast speaking rate. And you can see that the duration increases, but the important thing, when you think about talking fast, what do you change? What gets shorter? So if all of a sudden I'm talking like this, what am I doing differently? No, I'm not pausing less. Vowels. Vowels are the only thing that are truly free to vary. Okay, so vowels carry all the power of speech. So consonants carry the intelligibility, vowels carry the power. And if I talk really, really fast, you can still understand me because you can still hear me. And you've got the consonants. So what's free to vary are the vowels. So if you listen to, I know we talked about 94.5, the buzz. Um, do you ever listen to rock out with your stock out? <laughs> do you listen to the disclaimer at the end? The disclaimer at the end is, is compressed speech. And it sounds really, really, really artificial because it's time compressed and what has been squished is the vowels. So it sounds like there's really abrupt intonation contours and it starts sounding a little bit robotic. Um, so when you hear compressed speech, it's really, really tough to make it sound natural because what we do for prosody or the melody of speech, that's in the vowels. And if you compress the vowels, you've changed the melody of speech. So vowels are free to vary, but um, changing them really does impact, um, impact prosody. So if you think about time compression and, and when you think about the tongue twisters and trying to say them as quickly as possible, we talked the other day about the fact that if an articulator isn't used in the production of a current sound, it's gonna move on to the next one, right? So you essentially can have sounds being produced simultaneously. Um, and some are obvious, like top pole. Nobody's going to do top pole, right? It just sounds stupid if you say he, he's at the top pole. And some singers do that, and it sounds dumb. They shouldn't have released the plosive. They think they're over-articulating and being careful about speech, but it's just wrong. So you always compress, if it's the same two sounds, top pole, you're going to compress it. Um, another common one that is produced more efficiently is a glottal stop instead of a T. Now, some people deliberately do not do this. So Mr. Whitley, I would do Whitley, and he does Whitley. He does the T. 
So if he answers the phone, this is Mr. Whitley. I would never do that. I do Whitley. And it's a glottal stop to the L. Because I don't have to release the T and then go to the position for the L. So a lot of times if you can substitute the glottal stop for the T to make things go faster, you will. Do tadpole. Real naturally. Tadpole. Tadpole. Do you say the D? Tongue tip go up. Tadpole. Do you do tadpole or do you do tadpole? Tadpole. It's in there somewhere, but not if you start exaggerating it. And this is what gets weird when you're working with people with speech problems. They would probably try to say tadpole, and it sounds stupid. It's just not the way you would really say it. So you have to model tadpole. And they'll go, well, there's no D in there. And you go, right, there's not. Nobody says it with the D. S go ahead. Would you ever go to that super exaggerated point in order to like overcompensate for? Some people use that as a rationale. Um, I, I always go for naturalness. And you could argue it either way. Some people argue that you need to uh, drill exaggeratedly precise sounds because the exaggeration will go away when a person starts talking naturally. But people who have had motor speech, who have a motor speech disorder, aren't speaking naturally. So you have to decide if it's hurting naturalness and improving intelligibility, in which case you could argue for it. But if it's not improving t intelligibility and it's hurting naturalness, it's useless. So at the same time, could you, uh, could you also do therapy for prosody and intonation? You bet. You okay. should always be doing things with prosody and intonation. And, and they're interchangeable terms, really. Prosody is intonation. Do sidekick. Sidekick. He's got a new sidekick. Do you do the D? He's got a new sidekick. You do? No, no. You don't. Okay, I had me wondering there for a second. What? <laughs> sidekick. So if it's a DK thing, sidekick, it's quicker just to go on to the K and not put in your tongue in the position for the D and release it. So that's another form of time compression, and it's not going to impact intelligibility. Can you do an approximation where you're not releasing it, but the tongue is going almost there? Yeah. I, I feel something that like a D, but it is yeah. not... I feel it's something it's that the tip of the tongue is kind of heading there, but the only contact is actually made by the K. Yeah. So the palatometer would show that up. But it's different than saying sidekick, yeah. leaving it out totally. Sidekick, 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 sidekick. It's different than sidekick, I agree. So there's some impression of heading towards the D. Yeah, and it would change it acoustically, and it's probably enough for the listener to get it. Yeah. Um, my question is related to Amy's. Um, I do the same thing. I kind of take the tongue tip up, but it almost feels like a trill a little bit, sidekick, but I don't know if that's just because of... Sidekick. It uh, almost feels like a trill. I don't know if it's well, just Well, I think a Hispanic trill takes or? more time. If you're really doing a trill, it would it would like, decrease it's not efficiency an exact a lot. Trill, it just feels like it's a beginning of a trill, which is a real light contact. Right. Yep, yep. I think you approximate the articulatory position, but don't make contact. Psychic. And again, it's just for efficiency. But but also know that as listeners, we expect to hear that efficiency. We don't expect to hear exaggerated articulation with. A, a plosive released before the same plosive. It just doesn't happen. And when people do it in a song, it, you go, why did you do that? And, and you're sure some idiot producer told them they needed to articulate better. I'm sorry, go ahead. So what if your client is deleting the final consonant? Would you just teach them words that just enunciate the final consonant? Or? Are you talking like a kid deleting a final consonant? Yes. What you usually do is approach it in terms of uh, needing to maintain meaning. So, uh, bead versus bees, where the consonant has to be there to make a difference in the meaning of the word. Um, you wouldn't teach them only to say words that don't require the final consonant. No, you can't do that. But you try to put it in a meaningful context semantically. Yeah, it's um, meaningful pairs. It, it, they're contrast drills that you do. Okay, so let's talk about prosody. 
Um, again, it, it, most people use the term interchangeably with intonation. And um, there are three features in prosody. And they are changes. Prosody is not a static thing. Prosody is dynamic. So prosody is, um, prosody comprises changes in pitch, duration, and loudness. So what's the first thing to come to mind in terms of the usefulness of prosody? What are, what are some of the communicative usefulnesses? Usefulnesses? Usefulosity. Go ahead. Uh, asking questions. Asking questions. Okay, so, um, so to distinguish the type of statement, whether it's a, a statement or a command. Okay, yeah. Portraying emotion in your speech? You bet. Emotion is a biggie. And some of the most interesting studies um, have been done looking at the uh, speech, but primarily the prosodic characteristics of different types of psychiatric disorders. So Eeyore truly is depressed. I'm going to find my tail. Minimal prosodic variation. Slow rate. Stretched out bowels. <laughs> also maybe conveying important information like what's important and what's not you bet stressing important words so how many of you agree that prosody can make you crazy if a person's doing it wrong <laughs> Isn't it weird for something that's not really technically a speech thing? It could drive you nuts. And can you figure out what it is about prosody that, that irritates you? There are, there are certainly extremes in doing it wrong. What's one of them? There are some classics. High, high pitch, um, like high pitched voice. So, well, is it just a high, high pitched voice doesn't imply well, variation? Like dropping. Quickly. So extreme pitch changes. Who who is the classic stereotype for that? Drama queens. Drama queens. No, I wasn't thinking of drama queens, but they'd be good. <laughs> Melodramatic. <laughs> Nurses. How are we doing today? Did we have a good sleep? Yeah, that's great. Oh, I'm so happy. Right? You're going to slap her, right? So anything really, really extreme starts sounding condescending. Anyone, can anyone figure out why it sounds condescending to do that? Yeah. Because that's how you speak to little kids. Perfect. It's mother -ease. Now people are being PC and calling it parent -ease, but we know better. Really, it's mother -ease. So, <laughs> So the extreme pitch variations, and I think we talk about this in a little bit. Yes, we talk about prosody and parenting speech. But so it's appropriate when you're talking to little, little kids. It's really inappropriate when you're talking to an adult. Yeah. No prosody. When people talk like this and they're monotone. So who does that, though? I had a teacher in high school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bad teachers. I had a chemistry teacher who bartended at night and fell asleep at the board and sounded like that. <laughs> Wasn't there a comedian who did that? I forgot his name. Like Stephen something or other. Stephen Stein. Yes. Yeah. And, and he talked flat? He does it on purpose. He just, like, he says ironic stuff, like, mm. and it's just, but, like, with no, he intentionally does it. Yeah, so, so it can, it can the enhance the sarcasm ben almost. Stein. Or ben Stein. Ben Stein. Who else does really flat? Well, depressed people. Have you ever heard anyone who only varies one aspect of prosody when they're trying to stress a word. So when you're stressing something, we know that everything increases simultaneously, right? So pitch goes up a little bit, loudness goes up a little bit, because remember how they co-occur, and duration increases a little bit. Have you ever heard anybody who just changes one of those? Can you, which one did they change? I knew this guy who was really monotone for the most part. Whenever he'd say something that was kind of important and what he was saying, he wouldn't talk any louder, he wouldn't lengthen it at all. He just slightly increased his pitch. Just a little so bit. he'd be talking like this. And all of a sudden he'd go up a little bit and then up go Up a little like bit and then go like that. Okay. <laughs> so pretty flat. So he was only varying pitch. Okay. 
Uh, <coughs> what about like just changing duration? Like the guy, the boss on Office Space. <laughs> um, yeah, Peter. Oh, uh, <laughs> That's we're good. We need you to stay late on on <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> so he just uses he plays with duration more than anything. Oh, that's good. And then the the one that I know was a, a deacon at a church who just made me crazy. So when he emphasized words, the only thing he did, he didn't do pitch. He would talk like this, and then when he emphasized something, it would be louder. And, and he didn't change his pitch at all. He changed loudness and duration, and it was awful to listen to. So if you, you know, everybody wants the three to co-vary. Pitch, loudness, and duration if you're stressing something. Have to go together. But we've got a restricted range of what's acceptable for adults. And it's probably, if you start going more than half an octave, people are going to think you're sing-song. Okay, so we really, even people who are enthused and kind of interesting speakers to listen to, they go more than half an octave. You go, okay, you're out of my range. I'm not listening. I was trying to think of super bippy people. So high-pitched, fast rate. You what? <laughs> I have an example of that. I Push just, something. Oh, you got yeah. it. Thank you. I saw Beauty and the Beast at Miller Outdoor Theater, and the three girls that are just crazy over Gaston, they go, they just all speak really high pitched, really fast, like one breath. And would that be an example of this? You bet. Anything that changes rate is a prosodic variation. Um, and sometimes when you're up really, really high, you can't vary it that much. So you start sounding monotone at a high pitch, which would really be annoying. Um, and then if you're really, really low, like remember we talked about the female broadcasters who are kind of talking down here to sound more authoritative, they don't have anywhere to go. So they're going to end up sounding a little bit more uh, monotone than they want to, too. Yeah. What would you do to a person like that? Like that slap has problem. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's my boyfriend's mom, and <laughs> okay, I won't slap. <laughs> she is. Uh, oh my god, I can't listen to her. And what does she do? Which of the prosody things does she like? Fall you into? know, like old days, like hi, dear, hi. It's like, um, and it's like that all the time, oh, and I'm like, yeah. okay. You offer it up, and you're just. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it's tough, you know, and, and one of the things that I find really difficult just in being a speech pathologist is hearing somebody who has a problem and like not giving them my card. <laughs> I'm serious, it's terrible though. There was a person, I was checking out at Bed Bath & Beyond and there's a person there with spasmodic dysphonia. And I just wanted to say, you know, are you being treated for it? You know, do you know you have spasmodic dysphonia? You can't do that. Which Bed Bath & Beyond? I'm sure we all want to go now. <laughs> Well, she probably doesn't work 24-7. I'll go a few times. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's weird. Um, but, you know, my, my rule of thumb is unless a person asks you, you don't get to say anything. So if it's, if it's you know, potential mother-in-law material here, you, you can't. You have to smile. Stay away. <laughs> Be the perfect daughter. You don't even get to stay away. <laughs> Okay, so here's an example of um, prosodic stress. And, and one of the ways to elicit stress, so if you're trying to see, if, if you can't really tell from conversational speech, which truly you should be able to, if a client's having difficulty with stress, you can try to elicit it. Um, so you would say, did Bill buy, buy <laughs> tongue twister, <laughs> did Bill buy a new blue notebook? Mary bought a new blue notebook. Did Mary sell a new blue notebook? Mary bought a new blue notebook. And you can go through and elicit stress on different uh, words. So sometimes you're using stress to emphasize a word within a sentence. And other times it can be used to distinguish whether it's um, what the adjective is. So this would be Mary lives in a greenhouse, which would be an all glass, don't throw stones thing. Or Mary lives in a greenhouse. Um, and I did it, one of the first studies that I ever did was based on this type of contrast and we did it with uh, people who were esophageal speakers who only used um, air vibrating in their esophagus to talk and we studied, I went to a convention of people who had had a laryngectomy and found out who the best talkers were and, and recorded them and we found that when you were really really proficient 
esophageal speaker, you produce stress contrasts exactly like a person with vocal folds did, which is really tough considering you've got the big, huge esophagus vibrating. And the women that I tested were really good and were able to match a typical female pitch, even though the mass of the esophagus is so much larger. Um, so when you're highly proficient, you're able to maintain the... What is contacting? Like, what is vibrating? The walls of the esophagus. Really? Yep. Because the esophagus typically is just closed. Yeah. And so you force air into it. E, e, a, o, u. That sort of thing. I'm obviously not proficient, but that's the idea. So you, you get air into the esophagus. It goes down to about here, and you bring it back up again. So you relax the cricopharyngeus muscle. Air goes in, vibrates. It's tricky to control. Proficient speakers are just fabulous to listen to. Um, but it's not a skill that is as required as it used to be because this is clearly an aside. Um, now you people have um, a puncture that actually can shunt air from the lungs into the esophagus. And so you're dealing with pulmonary air instead of just the air that you can put into the esophagus and bring back up again. And their intonation patterns are perfect because you have all that air to talk on. You can vary uh, pulmonary pressure, um, vary pitch and loudness and duration, and they sound perfectly natural. So really good tracheoesophageal puncture speakers, the ones who have that little prosthesis to shunt air into the esophagus are the very best. <laughs> you're looking like you're trying to figure this out. Well, I am. How do they not drown when they drink something? Well, the esophagus is separate from um, the trachea. So the trachea is coming out to here, okay, just like a person who's had a tracheotomy. And then the, the prosthesis has like a little uh, shelf over it so that fluid does not enter and go into the lungs. It can't go backwards. So it has like a little, a little um, shelf that comes over here. So this is the part where the esophagus is. This has gone through the wall going into the esophagus and any food or liquid coming down will just go around it and won't go back this way into the trachea. Yeah, you do have some limitations, you know, but people with laryngectomies have to be careful taking showers to, you know, any, and they can't swim without using adaptive equipment and stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I kind of have a gross story. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know what this should, we should listen or not. Well, because you were saying how there is a prosthesis that allows the liquid to pass and not interfere with the trach. Well, I knew, I work at a, a camp with children with disabilities during the summer, and we had a kid one time who had to be dismissed from camp because somehow he was able to have the liquid build up in there, and he would run around and you put pressure and have it come out <laughs> and squirt on other people. And we were like, oh my gosh, we are going to be shut down because of this kid. So it, how does that work? I have no idea. <laughs> it it, it was, shouldn't. It, it was just... <laughs> <laughs> it will just to build up a lot of phlegm and liquid in there, and then it would just he would just shoot it out with a lot of pressure buildup. I've seen a lot of things in my days. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if he's building up that much liquid in there, it it sounds like he'd have pneumonia, right? So he's a very talented child who learned to trap it. <laughs> I can't figure it out. You know, some things when you're working with people who have had a laryngectomy are, are hard to get used to. They cough from here. Um, and, you know, until they learn to cover where they're coughing, it, it spews. Um, yeah, it, and it's a very strange sound. To cough from a trachea sounds really, really different um, than coughing from your mouth. Gurgling and, and kind of wheezy almost. Yeah. But after, after a few months after the surgery, they, they don't cough as much. The child, I, I can't even begin to consider. So. <laughs> okay, so here's another example of the importance of prosody. Calm down, boy. Can't you see I'm trying to rest besides what could possibly be so unusual about seeing a catfish? <laughs> but it's seeing a catfish. <clears throat> okay, so we've got prosody to signal affect. So you can say the same word lots of different ways and somebody will know 
how you're doing. Any any budding actors or actresses in here want to try this? No takers. <laughs> so, okay, you're being pointed at. You want to try it? Okay, so this is just no. Give me an emphatic no. What you need motivation? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, okay, here we go. No. Good. Surprised? No. <laughs> okay, go ahead, change the voice quality too, you notice. Angry? No. Oh, no, that's not nearly angry enough. Okay. No. Oh, that was good. Yeah, the teeth gritting was a good cue. Okay. <laughs> Disbelieving? No. Yeah, I probably would have done that a little. No. 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 <laughs> what actors do in their spare time? They play with intonation. Okay, so we also use um, prosody linguistically to signal turn taking. And this is where Canadians screw up because they go at the end, up at the end of sentences, right? When we expect our turn to be over, we're going to go down. So we've got, I don't think I can read what that says. So that one's a question. And then this is the answer that clearly goes down. Somehow to signal the end of your turn, you have to go down at the end. And then the person will, if it's not a question, the person will know it's their turn to talk. If you don't do that, you're not really following turn-taking rules. My favorite is prosody in parenting speech because what researchers have found is infants really latch on to the extreme intonation contours and pitch changes. So uh, parents tend to stress the content words. A bear, that, okay, that was the baby, sorry. A bear, and then the mother goes, look over there. So you, you, you do a high pitch, you grab the kid's attention, and you put the important words in there. Um, and people do this really, really, really naturally. It's amazing. Um, I never thought I would do it. And when my kid was born, it's, it's just the way you talk to him. And then one of the cooler studies that I read, and it was really anecdotal, it wasn't a true study, but a person had Oh, it's like the octuplets, but they were born all at once. The person had um, kids of decreasing age, and so when she would talk to them, her pitch would be the highest for the youngest kid and go progressively down to the oldest kid. So you adjust it by age. And you could probably do that all the time. I know I talk in a higher pitch to Andrew, who's still 13, than I do to his sister, who's 17. You know, and then my, my husband, I'm down here, right? So <laughs> So we, we do match prosody to the listener. And when we hear it is wrong, it's when it's not matched to the listener. Somehow they missed that you were a grown up instead of a kid or didn't get the age right. Okay, before we start this, any questions on prosody? It's pretty straightforward. Know the three components, pitch loudness and duration. Um, know the purposes, so stressing words, conveying emotion. Uh, signaling linguistic stuff and know that those three components need to vary together. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, speech researchers have debated about forever and still debate about is how do we get from perceiving speech to producing speech? How is it that this little baby can have this onslaught of talk at them and then figure out how to speak? So people have been trying to do, trying to figure out the link between perception and production. And because of what we can do now with imaging studies, um, a type of neuron called mirror neurons have been discovered. And they're just really, really cool. The, the neat thing about mirror neurons is they fire, so they're, they're activated. This was done in monkeys. They activate when a monkey performs an action. They are also activated when the experimenter performed the same action. 
Okay, so they're activated when the monkey's watching the experimenter hammer something. They're activated when the monkey hammers something. Okay, so some people believe that, um, oh, and it's also been observed in humans using fMRI. So you can see the same brain activation when somebody is watching somebody do a particular activity and when they are doing it themselves. Do you get the idea? So it's considered to be the link between perceiving an action and actually producing that action. So they're really useful in a number of ways. Um, it allows us to recognize what somebody is doing. So if I'm watching, uh, if I'm listening to a patient produce something, I will very often try to figure out what they're doing. Now I usually have to actually do it. If I didn't, I would be using mirror neurons to figure out what they're doing. Um, I guess I needed a little bit more concrete uh, for some things. One of my, fi go ahead. Um, I always thought about mirror neurons as being unconscious. So, because they are. They are? You bet. So when you're figuring out how to do something, are you like activating them on purpose? No, they're, they're naturally activated. Activated, okay. Yep. So um, one, of, one of the most tangible uses of mirror neurons to me is judging the feasibility of an action. So um, a real life example, we, we had a student, uh, he was a grad student and he had been a, uh, a professional boxer before he went to grad school. So I, I would see him when I work out at the wellness center and he would do exercises like have his feet on a bench and have his hands on one of those big, soft, mushy balls and do push-ups on the ball. Okay, so my mirror neurons would say, no way in hell, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but then I, then I was there once and I saw the swim coach and she did this stretch that I never saw before that was a way to stretch the, um, whatever's out here, external something. Hmm? No, the ones out here. Flexors, hip flexors. hip flexors. And she crossed her, she put her foot over her knee and she went into a sitting position hanging on to something. And I looked at that and I thought, yeah, I can do that one. <laughs> so it allows you to judge whether you can do something. Some, um, which tennis player was it? Andre Agassi, I think, said that he used to watch the Wimbledon finals and in the commercials he'd go out and try the moves that the players did. So he, he would watch it, he would figure out how to do it. Rod Laver was a, one of the earliest great tennis players. He was Australian, and he was the first tennis player ever to do an overhead backhand. And so I watched Rod Laver do it, and I go, cool, overhead backhand, I'm all over it. Um, so it helps you figure out how something is done, and then you, and then you try to enact it. So we can recognize tools. Go ahead, I'm sorry. How does this come into play with people that are, think they can do everything? <laughs> a lot that would like, be ego. Yeah, <laughs> ego. I mean, is that like, you know, if, are their mirror neurons actually telling them, no, do, you cannot do this, but their ego overrides it? And they're no, like, I think sometimes they don't understand the complexity of the action. So some things look simple, and they really aren't. So um, in our family, we only have stick shift cars, manual transmission. Andrew's 13, he's ready to drive, right? He says, I can do that. I go, well, honey, it's a stick. It takes, it's a little tricky. He goes, no, I can do that. And so I let him try it. And he was really, really upset when he stalled out the first time he tried it. So, but, but what he didn't know was you have to coordinate this and you have to move the stick, right? And then you have to, you know. So I think sometimes mirror neurons can be deceptive in that they don't tell you everything that goes into the action. So Rod Laver in his overhead backhand had practiced that forever, you know, and mere mortals aren't going to be able to do that on the first try. But it gives you cool ideas, you know, like if you watch the Harlem Globetrotters and, and the moves they do with basketballs, it makes, you want to, it makes me want to go out and play basketball, <laughs> but I'd never be able to do it because really, really super trained people, like highly trained gymnasts, you know, I can watch them and my mirror neurons go, yeah, that's way cool, but don't even think it. 
So, you know, I think you need some judgment in there too. So recognizing tools, you can see how uh, tools are actually used. You can learn um, appropriate uses for things. It's probably how, uh, you know, in some animal species, I think they're chimpanzees, that use long twigs to go into the um, wood to get the ants to crawl on them and then they <laughs> lick them off like a popsicle. <laughs> they, they probably teach each other using mirror neurons. One chimp sees the other do it and goes, yep, great ants. Um, so it's useful for that. The other really interesting thing, oh, learning by observation, right, that one's obvious. Um, establishing empathy is something that's getting a fair amount of attention now. So what population do we think of that has difficulty establishing empathy? Autism. autism, kids with autism. So now they're studying kids with autism and seeing if they recognize affect in others the way people who don't have autism do. And I think those are really cool studies. Because you know how it is when you see somebody who's like crying, it's really inappropriate if you act like nothing's wrong. And most people, you know, become a little more quiet, they slow their speaking rate down, you know, obvious ways to show empathy. Um, and if you're clueless, it just indicates a lack of empathy. What, what do the mer mirror neurons uh, do to someone who has Williams syndrome? No idea. Okay. Don't know enough about Williams syndrome. What is it? Um, I had to do a paper on it for neurogenics, but it's pretty much the opposite of autism. So they're very, very friendly, but they can't detect um, real, like they can't have any, um, show any emotion to like, let's say a car wreck, but they're extremely gregarious. And it's just basically cocktail talk but they can't do anything deeper than that. Well, it still sounds like empathy, though. Even, even, even though they don't show, they can't recognize fear in somebody, or they can't recognize that someone's really upset, and I better stop Yeah, talking. but that's the, that's the inability to recognize an emotion, which is the basis for empathy. So you have to recognize, yes, that person's upset. And then your mirror neurons will be activated and supposedly you're able to feel what that person would be experiencing, which helps you m modify your behavior appropriately. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if they're not able to recognize the imi initial emotion, mm -hmm. then they wouldn't be able to follow up appropriately. So I think it seems like the same kind of problem. Right. I, I just thought that since they were very social and autistic children aren't as, that there would be no. some sort of a difference. Not if they're not um, able to relate to the portrayed emotion. That to me goes back to the basics of the mirror neurons. Okay. Some of these we are not going to get into. I will take them out so I won't ask you about them. Let's skip to um, how babies learn language. <clears throat> now, the how babies learn language is, is highly speculative because nobody really knows for sure. Um, but at the University of Washington, um, they're starting to do fMRI studies of babies to look at what's activated. So Pat Cool um, has been at the University of Washington forever, and she's one of the most brilliant researchers in perception and infant language development um, in the world. And so um, the theory that I'm going to show you is uh, basically her theory. And other people would argue with it, but it, it makes sense to me. So I like things that make sense. So the first part of learning language is that inherently in the brain, we have basic categories that already exist for perception. So there are natural boundaries in what we hear. But in this initial phase, and we're talking young babies, we're talking really up to six months of age, okay, so newbies. In this initial phase, uh, people have found that newborns can accurately perceive all the sounds in any language. 
they can tell a difference between a Norwegian U and a, Nor and a French U. Okay, the even little, little, teeny, tiny changes, they go, yep, got it, that was different. And the, the term for this ability that Pat Cool uses is they are citizens of the world. Okay, they recognize all of the sounds in all of the languages. Because even those, though those natural boundaries occur, they don't impact the ability to discriminate among all of the sounds, okay? Even animals have natural boundaries in their auditory system. So animals can perceive voice versus voiceless as well as we can, okay? They've got that cut in the auditory system. So early on, the baby can, has this amazing discrimination ability but by the age of six months, the child's system essentially becomes more efficient and collapses to the point where the child now really only recognizes the differences in sounds that matter in their language. So that magnet effect that is Pat Cool's term and she says that the sounds then essentially are attracted to that the most representative sound in the language. So in Swedish, there are lots of lip rounded sounds. Those would collapse towards the oo in English. Okay, the child would no longer go, okay, that's a different oo and that's a different one tongue position. They go, no, they're all lip rounded, they're here. Okay, so it becomes, the, the baby becomes um, more wired to what matters in their own language. <coughs> so what the, the baby goes through is then um, this general, I can recognize everything to a specific recognition of this matters in my language. Now, there are all kinds of issues that relate to this in terms of bilingual language development. And, you know, a lot of um, overachieving parents thought, well, if they play tapes of other languages in the baby's crib, then they'll become uh, bilingual. And what researchers have found is in order to, vet, to develop proficiency in a language, what part do you think you need? Is listening to a tape enough? What do you need? Interaction. You can't put the kid in front of Spanish language television and expect him to pick up Spanish. You have to actually have the interaction with somebody. So in, in natural language development, you're interacting with somebody who's competent in the language. They emphasize certain words. They emphasize certain sounds. They subtly correct what the child did. You know, you have to have the interactive element of it. So it's believed that if you're exposed to languages early on, your brain retains some element of plasticity and becomes somewhat less hardwired to your own language. And I think most of you who might have been exposed to other languages agree that even if you didn't use it, it's easier to pick up other languages if you had some interaction with people who used another language when you were little. So that's what it has to do with in terms of kind of keeping those boundaries uh, less firm. And the final point I wanted to make um, is the importance of both auditory and visual information. So we know that we don't just learn how to say sounds auditorily. We, we rely a lot on visual input. It's why we have phenomena like it's harder to understand people over the phone. Because you don't, you don't have that visual input. You're missing all the nonverbal cues even though there aren't that many sounds that are produced with really obvious lip and tongue movements, they matter. So you'll probably find as a speech pathologist the occupational hazard is you watch people's mouths instead of their eyes. I do it all the time. Whether a person's intelligible or not, I look at your mouth, you know, <laughs> um, just because you have to when you're working with someone with reduced intelligibility. So I wanted to be able to show you the McGurk effect and I don't have it um, on my drive, so I'm gonna post it. And it's a really, really cool effect. And I want you to try it. So I'll post it and, and make sure you play it to yourself um, before Tuesday, okay? 
And what you'll see is it, it's an exercise where you will listen to something and you have your eyes closed first when you're listening. So you're only getting auditory input. And then you open your eyes and you combine visual and auditory and you see what happens. Okay? Yes? Uh -huh. um, how do you want us to do the transcription? Can we just turn in a copy? No, what I'd like you to do is um, if you have the fonts on your typewriter or your computer, go ahead and use those. If you want to do it handwritten, if you have a way to scan it, that would be great. If you don't, give it to me and I'll scan it. Okay, so give it to you before Thursday for you. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yep. Also, right over there, they have scanners. I just found one like before I came to class and I need to scan something. So they have them right there. They have scanners and you can save it to yourself. Yeah. So if you have it done by Tuesday, you can use one over there. Oh, that's great. Thank you. All right. Have a good afternoon, guys.